Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, this is Tenors to Human, and welcome to this special Games Guide edition of Medieval 2 Total War. Today we'll be looking at the Kingdom's Expansion Pack, specifically the Britannia Campaign, because we're going to look at how you can unlock the Baron Alliance. We'll consider the history behind the faction, any potential roleplay ideas, but of course the main thing here today is we're going to look at how you can unlock them in the game files. A little bit of fiddling around, but nothing too complicated, I'm pleased to say. As you begin a campaign as England then, you'll very quickly notice that they have a huge amount of the map and many, many more regions than their rivals. This of course is fairly accurate for the history, but it's also quite striking because in Total War we very rarely see one faction dominate the map so much right at the start. However, this particular era of Total War was very good for the DLC trying out lots of new things. And in this particular campaign, the Britannia campaign, it's really all about triggered events. There's lots of things like William Wallace, lots and lots of extra armies in Wales spawning. The main event is of course this, the English Barons Revolt. Now this is an unusual event in some ways because of course it is a bit like in Barbarian Invasion with the Ostrogoths, the Eastern or Western Empire rebels. They spawn out of their main faction, in this case England, when they have a rebellion. However, unlike a Barbarian Invasion, it's a little bit more complicated than that, because of course you can see here Dublin has had a civil revolt and is now the rebel faction. That's because you can see here it's turn 3. The Baron Alliance can't actually trigger in the early turns of the game. From turn 9 the Baron's revolt can emerge, although in this particular case it actually emerged on turn 12. It is a flexible event after all. We can have a little look in the game files to see what the exact triggers are. So who and what even were these barons? Well, as the game suggests here, they are actually a bunch of nobles who are essentially trying to gain more influence and power from the king. The war we see represented in the game though is actually the second barony rebellion. The first one happened around 50 years before the game. The peace treaty that followed was Magna Carta, a key royal charter of rights agreed by King John in 1215. By the time the game begins in 1258, the Barons are starting to itchy feet once again, feeling that the rights that were promised to them have slowly slipped away. The uprising Barons demanded more influence of King Henry III, and the rebellion was truly led by Simon de Montfort, the Earl of Leicester, who wanted to reassert the Magna Carta. Over time the disagreements became more and more fierce until eventually war broke out. In May 1264, de Montfort won a stunning victory at the Battle of Lewes. Seemingly, seemingly the war would be won here. He managed to capture both King Henry and his heir, the future Edward I. In essence, he was now the de facto ruler of England, governing in King Henry's name. In early 1265, he would call a parliament, and this is seen as a particularly crucial moment in English history. This is in many ways the first time that we saw a sort of representative democracy. Representatives of cities and boroughs were present, alongside knights all representing their countries to discuss matters of national concern. Unfortunately, it wasn't to last, and as the Parliament progressed it became clear that the Earl was positioning himself for greater power. The effect of this was the loss of one of his key allies, the Earl of Gloucester, Richard de Clary, who defected back to the Royalists. Prince Edward managed a daring escape from captivity, and with this he was able to lead a new attack on de Montfort. In spite of an alliance between the Barons and the Welsh, it seemed that the tide of the war was going against them. A surprise attack on Kenilworth Castle and de Montfort's son saw Baron forces absolutely battered before another key defeat at Evesham on the 4th of August 1265. Nonetheless, the cause would continue, and Gilbert de Clary, the son of the old Earl of Gloucester, would continue to soften the terms of the deal, ensuring that de Montfort's campaign was not for nothing. So then, which of our lovely English towns is going to be the home of our rebellion? Well, of course, it makes sense for it to be Leicester. Seaman de Montfort led the rebellion from there, but you might notice that yeah, Leicester doesn't seem to be on the map at all. A bit of a strange omission, considering the Baron Alliance are a key part of the game here, but alas, it's not in it at all. It is a little bit close to Nottingham, so it would probably be around this kind of area here. Maybe that's why they chose to omit it. Either way, I don't think Nottingham is going to be a good choice for us here. Mainly because this is the strong fortress of the English, it's way too powerful to give that over to the rebellion straight away. You'd probably just be able to bulldoze the English by taking their strongest settlement. No, I feel we've got to pick somewhere else. With Leicester omitted, Gloucester may well be a great choice for our little uprising here. The Earl of the time, Richard de Calary, my best French of course there, he was the Earl of this particular region and a key early ally of Simon de Montfort. 
Now, he did actually switch sides during this war, and his son, Gilbert de Clary, also flipped sides several times. These guys are actually ridiculous. How they made it through this war, I don't know. But they are certainly an interesting set of characters, and I think sitting here on the Welsh border might well make things all the more interesting for you. Now, there are other options, but I do think Gloucester is a particularly fun one to work with. If you want to move away from the specifics of the Baron Alliance and into just the independence movements in general, then you might want to role play as the Cornwall Baron Alliance, because down here we have the Cornish, who in some ways have more in common with the Bretons of Northern France, and of course the Welsh over here than they do with the English. Even today, there are people who still use the Cornish tongue down here, there is very much a revival of that. And the Cornish still have a sense that they're not quite the same as the English. And the other, of course, is York, because when do the Yorkshiremen not ever not go on about being independent? Just before we head into the files, then, let's just have a quick look at our new city, Gloucester, that we're going to hand over to the Baron Alliance. We've got ourselves one feudal knight, one armoured swordsman, and one armoured sergeant, and two longbowmen. That's important for us to note because, of course, we do need to go and grab these units in the game files and hand them over to the Baron Alliance. Also worth noting is the region name, which is the West Country. We'll need that too. Once inside Medieval 2 Total War, we're going to head down to the Mods folder, and from there we can get into the British Isles expansion. From here, it's going to be the normal route of data into World. Do note your folder might look slightly different if you haven't unpacked the files here. Into the World folder, into Maps into campaign, imperial campaign, and here we're going to find the files we need today. The campaign underscore script will tell us about the triggers for the Baron Alliance, but we're going to start in this one here, Deska underscore strat. This file should look pretty familiar to us by now. We of course are going to start by moving the Baron's Alliance over here, away from that line, and up to the playable factions over here. Just be careful with all of your spacing of course. If you use Control F to find the Baron's Alliance then, we'll search down and get to their section of this little file here. We're going to remove the dead until emerge and the re-emergent section here. Just tidy that up. And of course, if you want to play around the money, you can. You'll probably find that 3,000 in the King's Purse is quite a lot. Just put it down to 1,000. Maybe we want to put this denarii down to 10,000 too. It's very much your choice. I've tended to find that I have plenty of money when I play this campaign, so maybe bring it down just a little bit. Of course, we need to get ourselves a faction leader and a city, so we can head over to Gloucester and take that from the English. Now, do just be aware when you are using the find tool here, it is actually case sensitive, so we're going to search for West, capital W, and that'll bring us to our lovely settlement here. We've got ourselves a castle, so we're just going to grab that, give ourselves the space in between all of this. Lovely. And head back down towards the barons, and with that, yeah, there's a Welsh baron stable, but then we'll get back to our lovely section down here. Marvellous stuff. So we're going to add our settlement in. We can put that straight below the denarii, the king's purse. Of course, we also need to go and grab the army involved for this town, so we're going to head back to England, but things are a little bit different this time to when we normally go and grab these armies. Normally we obviously head down and we just search for the troops involved. On this particular occasion, the game has actually put Richard de Clary into the game. So we actually go and find him specifically. So we head down here, you can see our troops, the feudal knights, armoured swordsmen, armoured sergeants, and the two longbowmen. But he actually already has the character here for us. He's not actually a named character per se, He's not part of the family tree, but he is actually here. So you know what, we might as well grab him and we'll go and make him our faction leader. So I'm going to go and cut him out of there, just fix up all those spaces and head back to the Baron Alliance. So head down towards the Barons and we can paste this underneath our settlement here. Give us out a space, leave two lines for the slaves and we can edit it from here. Of course, we need to get a little bit more information into this line here. So to get an example, let's head up to King Henry of England and we'll show us what we need to put in this line. So we've got named character, male, leader. So if you want to example, just copy and paste that and head back down to the barons. You can make sure that you get your line complete. Of course, you can just type that straight in, but obviously it always helps to go and look at what the examples are further up in the file. So Richard de Clary. Name character, male, leader. Marvellous. 
We're going to head back another time though because we want to go and grab a bit more yet. He's got himself the bodyguard here. And he's also got himself a few traits. So I'm just going to go and grab all of that just to start me off. So I'm going to copy that. Head back down again towards the barons. Skip past the Welsh stables of course. And we will go and add that information in. So we'll just paste it in there. We've got our traits. Faction leader, good commander, austere, etc, etc. You can change this around as you wish. I'll show you very quickly where the traits folder is, where you can just check those up. But most importantly, we've added in the any bodyguard, which means that Richard de Clary will have his own unit. If you don't go and put that in, he'll just go and override the feudal knights unit here. At this point then, we're pretty much ready to start the game. If you like, you can change around the population, add buildings in or take them away as you so wish. And of course, if you want to go and change things around like the experience here, you are absolutely welcome to do so. Just before we head into the game then, we'll save this up. And I'll just show you a couple other files which may be of interest. Back inside the Imperial Campaign folder, same one where we just entered Deska underscore strat, is where you'll find this file here. The very interesting campaign underscore script file. Now what this one will do is tell you what the triggers are for all of the Baron Alliance events. Now of course we don't actually need to edit this to make them playable, we could load the game at this point, but I will just open it up quickly for you just to show you what these odd triggers are. Inside here are a long list of scripted events, and as I said on this particular DLC they've really gone in heavy on this. There's all sorts of bits of information for the Welsh Uprising, tons of units which will pop up at certain times, notifications for key settlements being taken, etc etc. But we of course really want to look at the Baron's Alliance. So, if we go and have a little look-see, you'll eventually find yourself at this section here, which tells you all about it. In this section, you can read away to your heart's content all about how and when the Baron's Alliance will spawn. You can see what I discussed earlier here, which is the first spawn opportunity, led by De Montfort, of course, happens after turn 8 and before turn 35. Because they're re-emergent, they can actually, after being killed, come back later in the game. So you have here a second spawn opportunity between turns 51 and 69, and you can see there's a third one, etc, etc. So there's all sorts of different information you can look into here if you want to know more about the Baron Alliance, but of course we don't actually need to change any of this to make the game playable. So we'll save that up, I'll just show you where the traits are if you want to edit those, then we'll head back into the game. Starting from back inside Imperial underscore campaign then, we're going to head back to the data folder inside British Isles. So if you've unpacked the files, you'll have access to all of these different little text files here, and that means we'll be able to go and look at the traits and ancillaries list. So you've got export desca ancillaries here, and you've also got export desca character traits. This folder here, this file will be able to show you everything you want to know about the different names. Back inside the game then, and you'll notice next to England on the campaign screen here, we have a new flag, that of the Baron's Alliance. Obviously, they don't have all this information here filled in properly, but we can play as them, so let's load up the game and let's see what's going on. Here we are then, as the Baron's Alliance with Gloucester under our control, a lovely little castle for us. Get some good units out of here actually, so it's not a bad place to start with. In many ways, you might actually want to weaken this a tiny bit, or maybe just improve some of the other cities around here. Either way, it should be a fun place for us to begin our adventure. You'll notice that Lord Richard here has himself his own trait, the leader of the Baron's Alliance, for plus three authority. Um, yeah, you'll know if you've watched my authority guide video how tricky authority can be to find sometimes. So to have that as an extra trait is lovely indeed. You obviously want people to remain loyal to you, especially if you're leading an uprising. Having removed the fog of war then, we can get a better idea of where we stand in the world and of course we are absolutely surrounded by English towns. But as you note, they are English towns. We took the castle in the region, which means we do have an advantage in terms of the military. But yeah, sheer numbers are definitely on the side of the English here. So until you start getting cities flipping to you, you're going to have to go out and push on the attack, I think. Luckily, the Welsh are at war with the English, and so are you. That means you'll be able to make allies with them nice and easily. Worth noting though, of course, as a castle you don't actually have yourself a diplomat. You can add that in the files if you want to, or you can wait until you've grabbed yourself a town. Only, only the wooden castle of Shaftesbury down here really stands in your way as a military outpost. What exactly is the legacy of the Baron Alliance then? Well, it's a bit of a strange one. Certainly Simon de Montfort is quite well known today. There's a university in Leicester named after him, and whilst he is remembered in some ways, 
as one of the key members of the first parliament back in 1265, he's also got a bit of a chequered history. You see, a big part of the way that Simon tried to get the support of the people was by removing the Jewish moneylenders. It is thought that hundreds, even thousands of Jewish people were executed or expelled from their homes in England during this time. That's not to say that Simon de Montfort was completely responsible for this. It was indeed a growing trend across Europe. This is the age of crusades and religious intolerance had been growing and growing for decades. The main reason the people might have supported him for his actions against the Jews were because of the practice of usury. This is essentially money lending and money lending with a hefty bit of interest on top. And of course, if you've got a load of people who are gathering up debts, these Jewish merchants, they're going to be quite happy if you suddenly remove those debts. Of course, we will now look upon these acts as completely abhorrent. But for Simon de Montfort, he would probably see himself as more of a liberator. To him, he would have been freeing his people from the tyranny of these debts. So as we ponder what the real legacy of the Baron's Alliance is, we've really got to reconcile these two different sides of the story. In a time where we're taking a good healthy look at historical figures and considering if they're really all that worth commemorating, de Montfort really makes an interesting little study piece. My intention in making this video was never really to try and look at controversial actions from Simon de Montfort. However, by looking at the history of the Baron Alliance, you can't avoid it. I think we have to kind of reconcile the apparent acts that were taking place. Perhaps what we take from this in the end is that it's not simply down to remembering one man, but remembering the ideas he was fighting for, the idea of democracy and that people should have representation. The legacy of the Baron Alliance can really be seen by the fact that the country today is a parliamentary democracy. Of course there is still a queen, there's still a monarch, but they don't really have any true power anymore. The queen herself acts more like a diplomat for the nation and indeed brings in a huge amount of tourist money. In the end, the Baron's Alliance left a lasting legacy on this nation, and that makes it all the more fun to play as on the game, I think, because you know that even if this rebellion was sort of put down and the kings would continue to rule, that really it wasn't all in vain. In the long term, they would win out. One final and important thing to bring up is that if you actually take out the English, you're going to lose the game right there. You might want to do what I've done here and leave them with one final city, because if we go and take it off them, we're going to destroy their faction. But of course, as the Baron Alliance, we are actually designed to become England once we destroy them. This though confuses the game. The game thinks the faction we've begun as no longer exist, and thus we die. See, the Baron's Alliance resumes, but then we'll get victory conditions failed, and that will force us to return to the main menu. Now, there is a way to get around this. If you've seen my Eastern Empire's Rebel campaign, you'll know that I actually re the game there so that I could continue playing. Now, the only reason I haven't done a video on this yet is because it's quite complicated compared to what we normally do. It takes a fair bit more of playing around. So I am looking forward to doing that in the future. I don't have an exact date for you at this point, but just to let you know, that is in the woodworks. If you want to avoid it in the meantime, just leave England with one final city. But as I said, there will be a video in time. That's all for today then, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed this little guide on how to unlock the Baron Alliance in Medieval 2 Total War. There will, of course, be more guide videos coming along like this. Typically on a Friday, we'll be looking at how we can mod the games from unlocking factions like this, of course, to general strategy guides. And there'll be some other little bits and pieces too. I want to try and vary up what we're doing on this Friday slot. So look forward to that as we go forward. But for now, I will leave you. I'm Thomas. This is Tenerce to Human. And this has been Unlocking the Baron Alliance. Thank you and goodbye. By Jave, it is a marvellous, marvellous day. Spiffing, one would say. Anyone for pimps. He has seen the light. He's joined the anarchy. He is cruel and cunning. And you know what? He likes a little drink. And I think that's marvellous. La 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 la. Chop your way through the peasants. One shot. No!